If I were Jesus, the number of shitty movies made about me over the years would really get on my nerves. Well, actually, they wouldn't. As an atheist, I believe Jesus was not a god or the son of a god, but just a guy. A guy who died thousands of years before the advent of cinema, and who therefore has no feelings about the quality of the films made about him, nor any feelings about anything else, him being dead and all. But hypothetically, if Jesus was still with us somehow, somewhere, in some way, and he was aware of all the lousy movies people have made about him, I think it'd get under his skin a little, you know? Unless Jesus would have terrible taste in movies, which is entirely possible, apart from the accounts contained in the New Testament, which were propagated by people who literally worshipped him and are therefore somewhat suspect as sources of reliable biographical information, we know basically nothing about the historical Jesus. He could have been the kind of guy who would engage in Star Wars prequel apologetics or defend the artistic merit of the work of Neil Breen. We just don't know. But assuming Jesus was still around, and assuming he had good taste in movies, by which I mean his taste more or less lined up with my own, I think the number of films about him which are of poor quality would be a source of annoyance for him. However, it's not all scourgings and crucifixions. Yes, there have been some awful movies made about Jesus over the years, but there have also been some good ones. There have even been a few great ones. Enough great ones, in fact, that I think it's worth asking the question, what's the best Jesus movie? So, like I said a minute ago, the list of movies about Jesus contains quite a few clunkers. But Jesus' movie career got off to a fairly decent start. The earliest surviving depiction of Jesus on film is in From the Manger to the Cross, released in 1912, directed by Sidney Alcott and starring Robert Henderson Bland as Jesus. It's a pretty straightforward series of dramatizations of scenes from the Gospels, reverent to a fault, as Jesus, Henderson Bland isn't asked to do much more than enter a shot, gesture melodramatically, and say his lines, which are usually taken directly from the Bible, shown to the audience via title cards that include chapter and verse. It's not great, but it's not terrible. And if you like silent movies or you're interested in the history of film, it's an interesting and important artifact. Jesus pops up in a couple of other major films in the years that follow. He's played by Howard Gay in D.W. Griffith's Intolerance from 1916, where a portion of the gospel narrative makes up one of that film's four parallel plot lines. He also appears in Civilization, released that same year, produced by Thomas Ince and directed by Ince, Reginald Barker, and Raymond B. West. Civilization doesn't depict any of the biblical narrative. Its Jesus, portrayed by George Fisher, returns to Earth to inhabit the body of a submarine captain who dies after refusing to fire on a civilian ship. After being condemned as a traitor, Jesus reveals himself and takes the king of this country on a tour of a battlefield to show him the folly of war and convince him to sign a peace treaty. Civilization garnered positive reviews at the time, but there were also some folks, critics and members of the general audience, who accused it of being in poor taste or even sacrilegious for using Jesus in the service of a film with a fairly pointed, pacifist political message. Me, I don't see the issue. Wouldn't Jesus be anti-war? The Prince of Peace is one of the dude's nicknames, right? But I'm not a Christian. I don't know why they get upset at half this shit. What I do know is that fear of offending the audience with an irreverent portrayal of Jesus is the main reason why there are so few depictions of Jesus from the early decades of the cinema. Directly depicting Jesus on screen used to be kind of taboo. Accordingly, after Intolerance and Civilization in 1916, there wasn't another on-screen Jesus until the original silent version of Ben-Hur in 1925, where he has little more than a cameo appearance. We never see his face, and the actor who plays him, Claude Payton, isn't even credited. The next full-on Jesus movie to be produced by a major Hollywood studio wasn't until two years later, 1927's The King of Kings, produced and directed by Cecil B. DeMille and starring H.B. Warner as Jesus. 
Like From the Manger to the Cross, I find The King of Kings to be more interesting for its place in film history than for its merits as a film. It, too, is little more than a series of dramatizations of scenes from the life of Christ as told in the Gospels. Unlike From the Manger to the Cross, The King of Kings stages these scenes in epic fashion, with a large cast, massive sets, and the gaudy pageantry which was one of DeMille's stylistic trademarks. It even features a couple of full-color sequences, which wasn't unheard of in 1927, but was still relatively rare. I don't know if I can honestly say I think The King of Kings is a great movie. It's an important movie. It's an historically significant movie. It's beautiful to look at. But do I care about what happens? Eh. Am I invested in any of the characters? Not really. And that's a problem I have with most Jesus films. There are many movies that dramatize the life of Jesus as told in the Gospels, but relatively few that tell stories which actually involve me. As impressive as it is in many ways, The King of Kings doesn't do it. Neither does 1961's King of Kings, starring future Captain Pike Jeffrey Hunter as Jesus. For my money, there wasn't a truly great film about Jesus until 1964's The Gospel According to St. Matthew, starring Enrique Irizoki as Jesus, written and directed by Pier Paolo Pasolini. Pasolini's Matthew is exceptional for several reasons. It's shot on location in the Italian countryside with lots of handheld camera work. Its visual style is simple, direct, almost pretentiously unpretentious. The same goes for the acting. Enrique Irizoki, who played Jesus, was a college student who had never acted before. Most of the cast was made up of non-professional actors. For the role of Mary, mother of Jesus, Pasolini cast Susanna, his own mother. It shows just as much reverence for the character and the story of Jesus as the earlier films I mentioned, but Pasolini's naturalistic style gives it an authenticity those other movies lack. Even today, over 50 years after it's released, Pasolini's Matthew surprises and defies expectations. There just isn't another Jesus film quite like it. Irizoki's Jesus doesn't look like we expect Jesus to look. His beard is thin. His hair is short. He's obviously very young. Irizoki was only 19 when he made the film. And when he speaks, it's with the defiance of youth. His miracles are presented matter-of-factly, without added pomp or embellishment. When he heals a person who has trouble walking, he simply tells them, throw down your crutches, and the healing is done. When he, spoiler alert, returns from the dead following his crucifixion, we see the stone falling away from the front of the tomb, and an angel, who looks just like a normal person, is there to tell the disciples what the deal is. They rush to a hilltop where they find Jesus waiting for them. No fireworks, no smoke, no attempt to impress upon the audience how amazing and important it all is. Pasolini tells the story in a way that makes it feel like the story is speaking for itself. There's another defiant Jesus at the center of the next great film on the list, Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ, released in 1988. He's played by Willem Dafoe, and he's unique among on-screen Jesuses because unlike the rest of them, even the interesting ones like Irizoki's, he feels like a real person. The Last Temptation of Christ, based on the novel by Nikos Kazantzakis, explores one of the central mysteries of the Christian faith, the dual nature of Christ. He is God and he is human, fully and equally both. If forced to choose between the two, which one does he choose? How does that conflict affect his life? He knows he's the Messiah. He knows he's destined to suffer and die on the cross. But how does he feel about that? Last Temptation lacks the religious reverence for the material that other Jesus films have. But that irreverence isn't the result of any disrespect on the part of the film, but rather a product of the way it treats the character of Jesus as a human being rather than a perfect object of devotion. This Jesus has doubts. He gets angry. He seems dangerous, transgressive, revolutionary. He gives furious public speeches, promising to set fire to the world. More so than any other Jesus on film, he seems genuinely threatening to the status quo. And it's easy to see why the religious and secular authorities would want to get him out of the way. 
In most Jesus films, the plot has a preordained quality. Things happen because that's just the way the story goes. In Last Temptation, the plot feels like it moves forward based on characters making choices and incurring consequences. It still has all the same beats of any other Jesus movie, the ministry, the miracles, the arrest and condemnation, the crucifixion, but it feels more organic, like a story, not a recitation of scripture. Scorsese doesn't tell the story with quite the same degree of unadorned naturalism as Pasolini. There's some slow motion, some montage. Defoe's Jesus does make the occasional dramatic gesture. But what stylistic flourishes there are always serve the story instead of overwhelming it. When staging the resurrection of Lazarus, Scorsese uses silence and stillness to build anticipation. Jesus stands at the opening of the tomb, calls Lazarus forth in the name of God, and, after an appropriately tense pause, we see Lazarus' hand reaching out of the darkness. Of course, the part of The Last Temptation of Christ that attracted the most attention when it premiered wasn't the way it presented the familiar elements of the gospel narrative. It was the bit with, you know, The Last Temptation of Christ. The movie hits all of the expected beats of the Jesus story up until he finds himself nailed to the cross. Then things take a turn. Jesus is visited by an angel who helps him down from the cross and tells him that God has changed his mind, that it's no longer Jesus' destiny to die for the sins of humanity, that he's not the Messiah. Jesus has been extremely ambivalent about the whole Messiah thing all along, so this is welcome news. He rests, he recovers, he begins a normal life, a life he was never able to have before because of who he was and what he thought he had to do. He begins a relationship with Mary Magdalene, who in the film is depicted as the love of his life, who he's known since childhood. There's a brief scene of Jesus and Magdalene having sex. It's hardly pornographic. It's kind of sweet, actually. These two people who have wanted to be together for so long can finally be together. Good for them. But it's Jesus, who's supposed to be sinless and chaste, getting laid, so some conservative Christians absolutely lost their shit over it. I didn't actually see Last Temptation until about ten years after its premiere. I was eight when it came out. And after I watched it, the controversy that had surrounded it and which follows it to this day seemed incredibly silly. Yes, Jesus has sex with Magdalene and has children and eventually takes other wives and lives the life of a normal earthly man, but if you watch the movie all the way to the end, which I've always found to be valuable when, you know, deciding whether or not it's a good movie— you see that his life after the cross, his life of peace and family, and one assumes mind-blowing group sex, is a temptation he ultimately refuses. Jesus approaches the end of his life. He lays in bed, dying of old age, while Jerusalem burns around him. He is visited by his old disciple, Judas, who in this telling of the story is his closest friend, who only betrayed him to the Romans because Jesus told him to in order that his destiny could be fulfilled. Seeing Jesus as an old man, Judas is outraged. He calls Jesus a traitor. He tells him that he wasn't meant to have this life. He says to Jesus, we did what we were supposed to do. You didn't. Then the angel that saved Jesus from the cross is revealed to be Satan in disguise. And Jesus, seized with renewed purpose, crawls back to the site of the crucifixion and begs God to take him back, declaring that he wants to die for the sins of humanity. He wants to be the Messiah. And in an instant, there he is back on the cross. Realizing where he is, what he has done, he laughs and cries out triumphantly, it is accomplished. So the gospel's with a Twilight Zone ending. What's not to love about that? But the Last Temptation sequence does more than freshen up the usual Jesus story by adding some new material in the last act. It completes the film's depiction of Jesus as a living, breathing, three-dimensional character by giving him the opportunity to make a meaningful choice. That's something that Jesus doesn't really get to do in other films, most of which prioritize a faithful and reverent retelling of the gospel narrative above all other concerns. The Jesus of Last Temptation is vulnerable, he's fallible, and his temptation is real, not just a preordained event in a story that's already been written. The story of Jesus in Last Temptation has weight, 
and drama because we see that it could have gone a different way. And things only end up the way they do because Jesus makes a decision and is willing to accept the consequences. For a guy who is the Son of God and capable of working miracles and even returning from the grave, Jesus typically has very little agency in his own story. Not so in Last Temptation, and it's for that reason, the fact that it shows us a Jesus with agency who makes meaningful choices, that I think The Last Temptation of Christ is the best movie ever made about Jesus. There are other reasons, too. It's just a brilliant film with an amazing cast. Willem Dafoe, Harvey Keitel, Barbara Hershey, David Bowie as Pontius Pilate. Come on. And Harry Dean Stanton as the Apostle Paul. I'm telling you. Peter Gabriel's score is awesome. It's a great movie. So if you were only hanging around to find out the answer to the question in the title of this video, there you are. What's the best Jesus movie? I think it's The Last Temptation of Christ. There. There. Now go and make disciples of all nations. Or stick around a few more minutes and I'll tell you what I think of The Passion of the Christ. There were other adaptations of the Jesus story produced between Last Temptation and The Passion, which was released in 2004, but they were mostly either forgettable made-for-TV movies or miniseries or explicitly religious projects that didn't attract significant audiences beyond the evangelical Christian community. The Passion, like Last Temptation, received a wide theatrical release. It was also nominated for Oscars and grossed over $600 million worldwide at the box office, making it one of the most successful films of the year and the highest grossing Christian film ever. But if the last century and a quarter of film history has taught us anything, it's that Oscar nominations and box office success don't mean that a movie is any good. So is The Passion of the Christ any good? Yes. I think it is. It's also all kinds of fucked up. Let's start with the good parts. Jim Caviezel makes a very good Jesus. The character as written isn't nearly as dynamic as his counterpart in The Last Temptation of Christ, but Caviezel invests him with some humanity through his interactions with other characters, particularly his mother. The whole point of the movie is to make us feel bad about the brutal execution of Jesus, and Caviezel plays him as such a nice, likable guy that it would be easy to sympathize with him during the lengthy heat spots that make up most of the film's running time, even if the beating he takes weren't depicted in such lurid, lingering detail. The film also benefits from its structure. A few flashbacks aside, The Passion, as the title suggests, concerns itself exclusively with the final days of Jesus. That focus on a specific and highly dramatic piece of the gospel narrative, rather than retelling the entire story, gives The Passion an immediacy and a driving narrative momentum that other movies about Jesus, even really good ones, just don't have. And, though it pains me to say this, because the film's producer, writer, director, Mel Gibson, is a massive piece of shit whose continued ability to find work in the entertainment industry is an ongoing refutation of the very concept of cancel culture, The Passion is a very well-made film on a technical and aesthetic level. Gibson, racist, anti-Semitic, misogynistic, garbage human that he is, knows where to put the camera and knows how to assemble a scene. The movie is hard to watch in places due to the brutality it depicts, but it's rarely boring. Its detractors have compared it to a snuff film, but it's like a really well-shot snuff film. The thing is, though, the snuff film dig isn't entirely unfair. It would not be an exaggeration to call The Passion of the Christ one of the most violent films ever made. And the violence hits a lot harder, no pun intended. Actually, no, you know what? Pun intended. I own my puns. The violence in The Passion hits a lot harder than violent scenes in a typical action or horror movie would because it's not there to thrill us or scare us. It's designed to upset us, to make us feel bad. Watching The Passion of the Christ can be a grueling experience, and it's supposed to be. And for lots of folks in the audience, that doesn't warrant a check in the pro column. The violence works against the film in another way. At a certain point, it starts to feel repetitive. 
Where this point is depends very much on the individual viewer, but I think for most people watching the film, there will come a point where it sinks in that the rest of the movie is just going to be a series of scenes of people doing really vicious, fucked up things to Jesus, and their eyes kind of glaze over. This problem isn't helped by Gibson's insistence on showing us this series of savage beatings in what feels like something close to real time. The worst example of this, for me, is the Via Dolorosa scene, where Jesus carries his cross to the site of his crucifixion. I specifically remember watching the film for the first time in the theater and sighing impatiently after seeing yet another shot of Jesus collapsing, only to set his feet lift the cross back up and carry on. The cross is heavy. He's beat the hell up. It's a long walk to Calvary. I get it. Besides the abundance of brutal graphic violence, the other big problem with The Passion of the Christ is the fact that it's, you know, rather anti-Semitic. And while this is definitely a problem, it shouldn't be such a surprise, because, as I've already mentioned, this movie was produced, written, and directed by Mel Gibson, who is, you know rather anti-Semitic. Jewish groups raised concerns about the film before it even opened, and those concerns turned out to be valid. The Passion includes many tropes that have been commonly found in anti-Semitic narratives for centuries. The Jewish priests are depicted as being leering and bloodthirsty. The film includes the infamous line from the Jewish priest Caiaphas, who declares of Jesus, Let his blood be on us and on our children! Gibson did agree to remove the subtitle translating that line into English, but the line spoken in Hebrew remains in the film. There are more insidious forms of anti-Semitism present in the film, too. Unlike other Jewish characters in the film, particularly the members of the Sanhedrin, Jesus and his followers are portrayed by handsome actors who look to be mostly of European ancestry. They don't really seem to belong to the same community as the rest of the Jewish characters depicted, almost as if we're not supposed to read them as Jewish, even though they all would have been. In fairness to the film, which, again, was produced, written, and directed by a man who once drunkenly told a cop that Jews were responsible for all the wars, it is possible to interpret this stuff in a way that isn't anti-Semitic. The Sanhedrin could represent the established religious order, which Jesus supposedly overturns, not evil Jews. And when the priest says, let his blood be on us and on our children, that curse could be read as applying to all people, not just Jewish people. It's about the sins of humanity, not the treachery of the Jews. And the fact that Jesus and his disciples are played by actors who are mostly not Jewish or Middle Eastern, well, The Passion is hardly the only film to follow that practice. Besides, Mel Gibson, the anti-Semite, said repeatedly in interviews that he wasn't trying to upset Jewish people with his film. He was just trying to, quote, tell the truth. And there are certainly no dark undertones to that. So, yeah, I know I kind of went off on a tangent about The Passion of the Christ there, but I feel like I had to talk about it because it's still a relatively recent film. 17 years isn't as long as it used to be now that streaming services and digital rentals mean that pretty much everything is always available. And it was so popular, and it's still perceived by a lot of people as being this great film. And parts of it are great. It deserves a lot of the praise it got. It's well-made, well-acted, well-directed. Mel Gibson is a good director. He is. But shit, Lenny Riefenstahl knew how to frame a shot, too. She was still a fucking Nazi. There are other Jesus films I haven't mentioned that some of you were probably expecting. Jesus Christ Superstar. I don't really dig it. To me, it's a mediocre musical that happens to be popular with some people. The Life of Brian, hilarious movie, but I wanted to focus on dramatic films. The Greatest Story Ever Told, it's a three-hour illustrated Sunday school lesson, and the most entertaining thing about it is getting to play Spot the Celebrity, thanks to the shameless and prolific stunt casting. The Jesus of Nazareth TV miniseries, directed by Franco Zeffirelli, exceptionally well made. Some interesting twists on the usual story, including a sympathetic take on Judas, but so goddamn long. The original version aired in four parts and has a total running time of nearly six and a half hours, for Christ's sake. 
and there are more. If you have a Jesus film you'd like to discuss, throw it up in the comments. I'd love to hear what you think makes for a good Jesus movie. For my 30 pieces of silver, the best movies about Jesus, and to me, those are Pasolini's Gospel according to St. Matthew and Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ, are those that treat Jesus as a character, not a divine being to be celebrated and glorified. In most Jesus films, Jesus is a flat character buried under a mountain of reverence. He's presented as a product to be sold, and films about him tend to play like grandiose sales pitches for Christianity, or sometimes anti-Semitic torture porn. The best Jesus films are those that show us more of the man than the Son of Man, that show us a Jesus who doubts himself and his calling, who gets angry, who defies authority, who faces real temptation, and who confronts a painful destiny which he fears, but which he also believes will lead to the ultimate greater good. It's not necessarily the greatest story ever told, but there is a great story there. It just needs somebody willing to push pious adoration to the side to actually tell it. So if you're that somebody, get out there and make that next great Jesus movie. What do you care if it pisses off a few Charlie churches? It ain't like they're going to crucify you.